Hello everybody and welcome to our Warsaw Safeguard in Partnership webinar on exploitation. Um, please say hi in the Q&A box and tell us where you're from and um, we'd love to hear from you all. Just to make sure, make you aware, there is a slight delay from you typing in the box to us, but I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me and that we are fully functioning. So I'm just going to wait a few seconds just to see if things start to come through. It takes about 20 seconds from yourselves to us. Yeah, people are starting to say hi there. That's wonderful. OK, so we've got some comments coming in now, so I know you can all hear me, so that's great. So let's make a start then. So hello, everybody. My name is Kellyanne Perry and I'm the Interim Practice Improvement Lead for Warsaw Safeguarding Partnership. Um, so since lockdown, which has been, what, 13, 14 weeks now, I think I've lost count. Um, but in this time, we've all had to make some significant changes to the way we live and how we do our job working across adults, children and with their families. Um, and one of our key priorities in Warsaw is exploitation. And when we meet as partners um, at the exploitation steering group recently, it was clear to me and to everybody that there's lots of fantastic work happening across Warsaw around exploitation um, with both adults and children services and we really wanted to share that with you today. It was also really apparent to me listening to partners um, that just as we've had to change the way we work, so have perpetrators, um, and exploitation during lockdown hasn't stopped. It's just like us, perpetrators have had to think differently and we will share some of that with you today. So it's lovely to have so many of you on here from lots of different agencies, from both adults and children. We currently have live with us 179 attendees, which is absolutely fantastic. I think this is the largest um, webinar we've had, and I know that we've still got probably several people who will, will join us. So that's fantastic and, um, and it's lovely to have you all with us today. So what we would like to do in the next half an hour is to think, sorry, next hour and a half is to think about how we can support people who have been exploited and to get a better understanding of what services are available and how you make referrals. Um, and we also wanted to let you know that in light of COVID-19 and social distancing, even though there are some restrictions that are gradually being lifted, what services are out there and what they are able to provide in the current climate and moving forward. So today we have quite a few guest speakers with us from across the partnership who are all really excited to be here with you today to speak to you about their services and what they're doing around exploitation. So today you're going to hear from Andy Thompson, who is the operations manager from Street Teams, who will start the webinar looking at the national picture around exploitation. We're then going to hear about what we're seeing in Warsaw. So we'll hear from Imran Suddle and Jade Brown from the Exploitation and Missing team. We'll hear from Inspector Jamie Hobday, Partnership Team Manager for West Midlands Police and his colleague Lisa Mullen, who is the CSE Coordinator from the Public Protection Team. We've also got with us Christine Jones, who is a named nurse for safeguarding children for Warsaw Healthcare Trust. Helen Matthews, who is the chief exec from Street Teams. We've got Mike Collier, who is the integration area projects manager for Warsaw for All. And finally, we'll hear from Nicola Smith and Emma Harper, who are advanced practitioners from Adult Safeguarding. So as you can hear, we've got a jam packed webinar full of lots of slides, lots of information to get through. I will ensure that after the webinar is over, I will send all of the slides out to all of you so you've got that because like I said, there's a lot of information on there and we want to make sure that you, um, you know, you've got that with different email addresses and links on. We also are recording the live webinar today. Therefore, if you've got colleagues or you want to go back to listen to something um, specific that you heard, you'll be able to access that and I'll send you the link out to that after the webinar as well. Um, and that will go on the Warsaw Safeguarding Partnership website. 
So we're hoping by the end of the session you will feel equipped with the right information to um, help spread any key messages that you've heard and um, hopefully you'll have had some time to reflect within your own role and maybe within your community around people that may need some additional support and where you can access that support from. So just before I hand over to Andy, um, even though we can't see you or hear you today, you can interact with us as part of the webinar by posting any of your questions or comments in the Q&A box. We'll be picking these up at the end of all of the presentations um, to make sure we keep on track with time. If we do run out or go over slightly, we will make sure that any questions that you do post or comments, we will we will make sure we answer them and get them back to you. But we are hoping that we can have a little um, a live Q and A time um, at the end of the session. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Andy Thompson from Street Teams. Thanks, Kellyanne. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Andy. I'm the operations manager of Street Teams. I've got quite a few slides to get through in my 10 minutes um, on what's actually going on in the national picture at the moment. So if I go too fast, this is being recorded or just get in touch with Street Teams and we'll come out and talk to you or, or do another one for you. And um, if we can, we're on the first, we should be on the first slide, Kerry, but if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, just as Kellyanne said right at the start, um, coronavirus outbreak has put entire industries on standby and it feels like everything's just paused at the flick of a switch, but um, drug dealing has not been paused. People's need for drugs has not been paused and the exploitation and grooming of children has not been paused at all. In fact, I'm going to talk about over the next few slides, the fact that a lot of young people are now in their houses on the internet while their parents are all um, at work, which has made them much more open uh, to being exploited. Where there's a demand, there's a supply, um, and it's still happening, folks, all over the place. It's, it's, a, it's adapted, it's become more creative, and I'll talk about that as we go on. Um, yeah, exploited 16 and 17 year olds um, are, are known to the police and are quite conspicuous when they are out in the local area. And we have seen a lowering of that age quite dramatically now. We're, we're actually seeing um, across the country seven-year-olds being groomed for county lines drug dealing, eight-year-olds being groomed for county lines drug dealing, and we know of a place in, uh, down south that found three eight-year-olds in a block of flats, um, a, a cuckoo's premises, um, a couple of months ago. So um, we need to be aware of the fact that it's not just the established people doing this, young people are being groomed all the time. Believe it or not, these gangs are not massively focused on the health and safety aspect of what's happening to children. Um, they just need to make the money from dealing those drugs that they've lost so far. If we can move on again, please, onto the next slide. Yeah, there is an increased concern around the use of girls. It doesn't say it in this report. We're going from a specific report with this update um, because they feel that girls can move around easier during lockdown. But um, um, it's Monday morning. I'm not gonna put you off your breakfast or your lunch. But if you've heard of plugging, and you've heard of the way these kids are forced to store these drugs and carry these drugs around. Um, girls, uh, I won't go into the biology of it, but girls are double the money and um, they can move these girls around uh, more, less often with more drugs, which is really important to understand. Although it doesn't mention it in this report, that is the reason they're using girls, it's that specific. Um, youth services have been halted um, to a certain extent and can't be out there because of COVID when they were giving the most valuable um, support to young people. Um, and we now see young people in areas that are hotspots that were never involved in crime before because they've been groomed while we've all been on lockdown. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, there is a likelihood of new children being lured into county lines. There is potential for some families allowing their children. And we, we have seen evidence of this. Um, some families are allowing their children to deal drugs because that's the only money that's coming into their home at that time. And if you've got nothing, your, your universal credit hasn't been rolled out, your benefits have been stopped, you're on a sanction, uh, and your child's receiving messages online that they can earn £100 a day, um, up to £400, £500 a week. Um, we've got to be very specific with parents as to the dangers of this, the actual dangers of this, and what their children will actually go through. Um, they don't see the pain, they don't see the fear, they don't see the injuries, 
they only see the money coming in. And how are we presenting to the families we're working with the dangers of what their ch child will go through, particularly if they try to get out of this situation? So early intervention is vital. Uh, the recruitment of more local workers. Um, county Lines has proven to be a business model that exploits and uses fear alongside digital technology control to monitor its workers. They're being followed on Snapchat, uh, contacted on WhatsApp, Wicca, and I'll talk about those and just ask if you've got a, a full grasp on what all these apps do as we um, quickly move along. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Kerry. Um, yeah. Some boroughs are reporting a noticeable increase in the length of time a young person is missing because they are keeping young people in cuckooed premises, uh, abandoned premises, longer because that child's more conspicuous out and moving about. So you might lose a child for a week, three days before, um, two weeks maybe, but now they will keep that worker. So if I stop calling them a child and start calling them a worker, sounds absolutely horrible, doesn't it? Uh, but that's just the way it is, I'm afraid. They will keep hold of that worker for longer so that you don't have to go through the process of shipping somebody else around, basically. Um, given that there is still demand for Class A drugs and that by retreating from the market, even temporarily, gangs risk giving that territory to another group or gang, they will just carry on, finding new methods of transport, new methods of distribution. Um, cars are being used a lot more now. So trains aren't running or kids are more conspicuous on trains, coaches. So cars, rental cars are being used much more now for shipping children around. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Stacking. Um, stacking is the term. Now, if you have a read of that, but um, really important, they will send out a burst text to loads of people or make bursts phone calls to loads of people and tell those people where that drug dealer or that child will be for a 10-15 minute period that day. Okay, um, a child might turn up with a backpack on full of drugs and someone will grab the child and deal the drugs out of the child's backpack while they just stand there and you'll get 30 or 40 drug users and drug addicts turning up to one place to buy their drugs in one place and it's called stacking. Um, it happens very quickly because the public catch sight of 40 people standing in one place um, uh, for any length of time. So it will only be for 10 or strictly 10 or 15 minutes and then everybody will vanish again. We do feel um, as a charity that the use of hotels, once hotels are back up and running, stacking will be happening in hotel receptions, hotel rooms, because um, it's, it's less conspicuous than being out in the local area. Uh, on to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, the use of social media, it's a core part of the County Lines model, used to market availability of drugs, recruit and groom young people, and arrange deals. That technology is constantly developing, and I'm probably going to mention a couple of apps that you've never even heard of. WhatsApp, you've heard of WhatsApp. Everybody's on WhatsApp because it's free uh, and it's encrypted. Instagram, um, Obviously, Instagram is used for grooming children because you can message kids on there even if you're not friends with them. But the major one, uh, Viber, Viber is just the same as uh, WhatsApp, except Viber have changed their settings now so that if you message a child on Viber, you can set your message to delete after two minutes. So there would be no evidence of you grooming that child unless the child then screenshot their phone there would be no evidence of a child there being groomed by you, sending them videos, photographs, because you can set your message to delete after two minutes. Telegram, have you ever heard of Telegram? If you haven't heard of Telegram, all I'll say to you is, please can you research that? The new app called Telegram, and more recently, Wicca. So these are all being used to groom children. You must have a handle on the main grooming tool this country, in this country for grooming kids. It's a core part of the County Lines model. With a cohort of young people isolated, bored and poor because of lockdown, there is a danger that as restrictions start to lift, gangs will find a new generation of recruits for a new professionalised local model. So uh, just to be clear, everyone now is waiting for this lockdown to be lifted. Everyone is waiting to be able to get out there because they've lost so much money 
They've built up so much beef online between all these other gangs and all these other people that they can't wait to get out there and start these markets up again. And we're asking you for early intervention, spotting the signs early and getting in there. If we can move on to the next one, please, Kerry. I won't go massive. I've, I've just done this. But just to show you that it is coming up in the media now, drug gangs are on a massive recruitment drive for children, not the established children, although they are using the established children to groom other kids. It's not some 40-year-old bloke grooming kids. It's that 17-year-old who's got the best trainers, that 18-year-old who's got the best hoodie. They are the ones who are online grooming kids because kids want to be like them, want to be recognised by them, and want to feel um, that they mean something to them. Okay? Um, Drug dealers are standing out during lockdown. Oh, on to the next one, please. Sorry, Kerry. Drug dealers are standing out during lockdown. They're much easier to spot. So how are they moving their supplies? On to the next one, please. We have heard about them dressing children as joggers and telling kids, teenage kids, to pretend they're out jogging or they're using um, their one hour a day they're allowed out to, to deal drugs or wearing an NHS lanyard even. If you go on to the next slide, please, Kerry. Using an NHS, uh, go, oh, go on to it in a minute. Um, so as not to be uh, detected. But this is really important. Young people now are carrying more drugs for those jobs. So they're out for longer with more drugs. It used to be you'd send out a child less frequently with less drugs just to do that deal. Now a child is out longer, but with more drugs on them. Um, anybody who sees that child, whether they're a gang member or a police officer, probably know that that child's got up to 10 times more drugs on them than they normally would have done when there wasn't a lockdown. Uh, if you go on to the next one, online child abuse uh, warnings during lockdown. We have got, if I can just move on to the next one, the Guardian one, Kerry. Um, they have released a predator's handbook to give predators advice on how to best groom children who were at home and online during COVID-19 who wouldn't normally be at home and online. Um, is this already in the UK? And if it's, well, it will be, just it will be. But um, if it's not, uh, how long before it is? And it, it just will be because it gives them um, predators top advice on how to groom, groom your children. You should be checking children's, your child's phone um, and just have a, 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 an understanding of it. If we can go on to the next one, please. Just as I said, drug dealers are dressing as joggers and using fake NHS ID badges to avoid police detection during the coronavirus lockdown. They are changing their tactics to avoid infection by doing letterbox drops, letterbox drops or drive-by sales and throwing drugs from the car window after arranging deals by phone. Money is just chucked into the back of the car onto the back seat. So they're taking precautions, but it's still going on. Uh, the drugs market and impact availability equals accessibility. Availability suggests the existence of drugs in the wider market and may be tied to production volumes. Accessibility reflects the capacity to locate and fund them. So are dealers and users able to source and purchase the drugs? And are they still producing and are they still produced and the supply chain still working in your area? Of course they are. Um, the UK will start to see growing shortages over time as heroin and cocaine produced on other continents are no longer able to pass through transit locations and rely upon trade and industry for familiar concealment opportunities. So the price is going to go up. These drugs are going to, going to become very valuable commodities. The children are not that valuable, if I'm perfectly honest. And they will now call children BICS, B-I-C-S, BICS, because um, they see them as totally disposable. Once we've used them, we will just uh, dispose of them. Uh, business model impact. This may include exploiting daily exercise. We've done that. Um, Older group members will explore options to justify their movement by claiming they're going to essential work. Uh, we've got a disrupted wholesale supply chain, competing county lines groups, current little and often cash collections and stock replenishments increases to greater and less frequent runs with more drugs on you. 
Transporting the workforce increasingly relies on travel by car, utilising new routes and schedules to avoid detection. Work is being dropped to multiple locations from one vehicle. An increased number of satellite hubs emerging, reducing journeys from the centre to local markets. So that means more vulnerable people in their housing being cuckooed and staying in those cuckoo premises for longer and making sure they're closer to where the markets are for those drugs. Um, accommodation options becoming limited due to the closure of hotels and Airbnbs, placing additional pressure on vulnerable residential occupants to host workers. So if you're in housing, how often are you checking up on your most vulnerable people in their housing? Uh, and just have a read of all that, I won't bore you with my voice any longer. Prolonged exposure to dependent drug user community increases the risk of further communicable disease. So you've got to remember that while the children are out there, there's still a, a good risk that they could catch something, particularly from drug users, uh, drug addicts, and um, turning up to meet these children in certain areas. Um, how safe do we know all those people are? How uninfected do we know all those people are? Um, workers within county lines may be at greater risk of exploitation. A decrease in wages is a likely consequence, and they might not be harmed at all. Uh, paid at all. So delays in payment, the possibility of no payment at all is harming their general well-being and mental and physical health. So they'll still be told to do the deals even though there's not the money at the end of it that they used to be. Workers in county lines at risk of being greater encouraged to commit other crimes or forced to do that for survival because they're not getting the money how they used to get it. Okay. Workforces are already reported as decreasing which could leave long-term missing from home workers, um, missing from home workers, children, stranded and without the funds available to get back. Reports also confirm examples of adult workers travelling to new locations, making them vulnerable in less familiar settings or going missing into locations they are not associated with. Um, and that's the end. I think I was only 10 minutes, Kellyanne. Uh, if, if anybody's... I think if anyone's got any questions now, if not, I will hand over to Imran. Thank you for that, Andy. Um, yeah, there's a question come through, but we're going to hold and leave all the questions till the end, if that's OK with that's everybody. Fine. So if you yeah, can stay on with us, Andy, and answer any at the end. Um, yeah, so no that's a, that was um, just giving you that idea of that national picture. We now want you to take you more to that local picture of what that looks like now within Warsaw. So you're now going to hear from Imran Suddle and Jade Brown, who are from the um, exploitation and missing team within Warsaw. So Imran, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks Kellyanne. Hi everyone, I'm Imran Soddle, I'm the Child Exploitation Officer for the Exploitation Team and I'm really happy to be presenting to you today on behalf of the Exploitation Team alongside my colleague Jade Brown. So as um, Kelly alluded to, we're going to try and build on um, the Street Team's presentation which gave you some kind of key messages coming through about the national picture with, with what we know is coming through on the local level um, in, in relation to what, what our data is telling us about the, the, the local picture in Warsaw. So can I go to the next slide, please? OK, before before we get into what our data is telling us, just we just wanted to uh, obviously re-emphasize the point about uh, exploitation that, you know, professionals know it's a very serious form of abuse. It's when children, young people, adults and sometimes groups of those categories, it's when those people are drawn into quite horrendous forms of uh, abuse, um, which lead to life changing impact, including death. So because of that, because this is a serious subject, I mean, we, we feel and I know our, our colleagues will agree that we all as professionals have a professional duty to make sure that we're aware of the, the, the right policies, the right procedures and the right practices that lead us to respond effectively to this sort of subject. Um, so just just wanted to remind people of that. And also, if you're new to this area of work and if you're new to the council, you've got all this information on the Warsaw Safeguarding Board website, which can which can which can assist you. OK, thank you. Next slide, please. So what's our data telling us? Well, as, as Andy alluded to, um, there's been a big reduction in referrals over lockdown. Um, 
that doesn't tell the whole story, um, really. I mean, we, we, we feel there's been a lot of underreporting. So, for example, we think uh, parents and carers are less likely to report their children missing, maybe because of the stigma of, bro- of breaking lockdown rules of social distancing. And also there's been less re- referrals because there's been less resources, obviously, on the ground. There's been less contact with our communities, with our vulnerable families and, and so on. In fact, when we found some of our data shows that in terms of children who have regularly gone missing before lockdown, those children have continued to go regularly missing. And we think some of the perpetrators have taken advantage of this and using lockdown uh, as cover. So when children go missing for, say, for, for, for significant periods, say for three days or more, we know that they are coming back with injuries on their eyes and their hands. Some have been assaulted. Um, with cross with with crowbars, some have been drawn into assaults, some have been threatened by um, gang uh, members, and and as a result, they're scared to return home. Like street teams have said, there has been an increase in in, in online abuse. We kind of feel that 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 that's sort of coming through. And one of our most serious cases at the moment, we have a looked after child who's been organised on a premium Instagram Instagram account where sensitive images of herself and videos have been sold for to adults for money. Now, hundreds, thousands of pounds are coming into this account every month. So, you know, this is really serious stuff. Um, this child's been drawn into hotels and been, she's been offered class A drugs. Um, senses that drug dealers are involved in this and very serious players. And we're worried about the trend here. We're worried about, you know, children finding new ways of have been drawn into this online abuse, particularly given the economic context at the moment where we know a lot of children uh, haven't got regular forms of uh, income coming through their, their job. They're very insecure in terms of jobs at the moment. So that's something we want to draw to people's attention, everyone to watch carefully. While we've got some serious cases, at, at, at the same time, we need to be measured about how we tackle exploitation. We need to make sure we use an evidence-based approach, a data-driven approach, just because we just we don't want to accidentally, you know, create an alarmist sort of situation where, um, you know, our community is already struggling with resilience at the moment. So we want to make sure that we, while we take the issue seriously, we reassure people as well. We're, we're mindful that exploitation can be taken advantage of by communi- by by groups to pit communities against each other. Next slide, please, Gary. So, um, like 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 others, we've got used to the new norm in terms of how we're working at the moment with Microsoft Office and Skype. We've used it effectively to organise and chair different meetings. So recently, in in response to a concern that our young people, um, other young people around the West Midlands, were being drawn into quite serious organised crime. We held a, a mapping meeting with, I think, 21 colleagues uh, made up of practitioners, practi- practitioners right across the West Midlands area. Um, in some ways, you know, that went well and it would have been more difficult to do that meeting, I think, in, in person. So in some ways, we're trying to make the technology work for us. But there are there are limitations as well. Um, we're also tapping into the work of our third sector, some of our groups, um, work, live in in our affected uh, communities and have continued to provide a really good response right through the, the lockdown period. For example, the Afghan voluntary sector group has provided timely support to one of our looked after ch- children who has got a history of being of, of, of fleeing the Taliban, living in a war like situation, being trafficked. And the whole lockdown period has been a very difficult experience for him because it might have re-evoked those sort of traumatic experiences. So the response of the Afghan uh, Community Association, sort of timely, empathetic, has that been absolutely criti- critical in keeping that young person um, and holding that young person together. Um, we have a few relationships with, with some of the few youth workers that we have got left here in Warsaw. And um, again, they're working in affected communities. They're sharing really critical information about the, the impact gangs are having over the lockdown period um, and the risks they pose. And we work in a very, with, with our partners, we work in a very careful way to make sure that whatever information youth workers share with us, 
we 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 work with that sensitively to make sure that their relationships um, are, are you know with 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 young people are never compromised. Thank you, Kerry. Next slide, please. So, can practitioners make referrals? Yeah, it's uh, business as normal. Um, we are part of a duty team, so every day. Um, uh, members of the exploitation team will work with four specific specialised teams from the police to consider new referrals, to consider new missing reports, to track current cases. And we share information. We have an information exchange because we want to understand what's happening to our to our children, our families, but also the kind of changing um, tactics perpetrators use and the kind of locations they use and the kind of grooming they, they employ. So that's that that meets every day. Um, part of our role as an exploitation team is to support practitioners, um, make referrals, but also you know tackle you know these and uh, tackle these and address these cases. We you know we appreciate these exploitation cases can be very complex. They uh, can be very challenging. They can be very forensic and very time consuming. So. We recognise that, and that's the, that's an essential part of our role, where we want to assist those teams who are who are kind of taking the responsibility of these cases. So please, you know, if you feel that you need to discuss a case, you need to run a few ideas by us. Please, you know, pick up the phone and um, and get in contact. I think that's um, that's that's it for me um, today. So if you've got any questions, as, as Kelly said, please don't hesitate to ask. We're we're happy to kind of answer them after the the presentation. So I'm now. Going to hand you over to my colleague Jade Brown. Thank you. Thanks, Imran. Um, yeah. So, what will our response look like post lockdown? Um, as we're trying to safeguard some of the most vulnerable children, our service is constantly developing, and we as practitioners are constantly learning. COVID nineteen it's brought new challenges to our service and new elements of risk to our children and young people. As Imran stated, we still don't fully understand the impact the lockdown has had on our vulnerable children within the Warsaw Borough, which is why we are um, closely working with our counterpart colleagues across the West Midlands region so that we can share best practice with them and learn from each other and make any necessary li links um, to ensure we're disrupting exploitation where possible and safeguarding our children. As the saying goes, um, new challenges bring greater achievements in our team. Um, we're very optimistic about the, the new changes to our service and our response post COVID-19. Um, we are expecting an influx of referrals because, as Imran stated, our referral rate has um, dropped recently, but post COVID-19 we, we're expecting an influx and we do anticipate that reports of missing children will, will increase. We will be continuing to develop our working relationship with partners and gradually move to an exploitation hub. The police are going to speak more about this during their presentation. Um, our service will be moving to an all aged support service, which means that adults um, who are experiencing exploitation will be screened and offered the necessary support and disruption as well. Uh, we've also got a new screening assessment and a new pathway for exploitation. This has been developed and it's um, currently being finalised and it will be launched soon. And uh, finally, we will be also be working on new community facing projects, which will place exploitation at the heart of everyone's agenda. Thanks. That's wonderful. Thank you um, to both Imran and Jade for that. Um, I'm going to very quickly because one of our police representatives does need to go to another meeting. So I'm going to hand you over now to Jamie Hobday um, and Lisa Mullen from West Midlands Police. Um, and Jamie can talk to you about what West Midlands Police are seeing currently. Good morning all. Thank you very much, Kellyanne. I appreciate that. Really pleased to be here today talking to you all. Um, I'm Jamie Hobday. I'm the inspector in the uh, Neighbourhood Policing Police uh, Partnerships team, which is a small team that focuses on some of our, uh, as the name suggests, partnership working with the local authority and uh, other organisations around Warsaw. Uh, a large part of that and a growing part of that is our work around targeting um, the exploiters and supporting the exploited out there, both children 
and adults. Um, Lisa will be doing the second part of this presentation, and Lisa works uh, in the Public Protection Unit, as well as a Neighbourhood Policing Unit and the Public Protection Unit. Our force CID team have a large role to play as well. So internally, it's very much a collaborative effort as well as outside. Okay, you're going to get a lot of detail. You've had a lot of detail already there from street teams about the, the, the sort of way, the sort of MO that uh, exploitation occurs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the way the police are dealing with it right now and some of our moves um, in the coming months. So just to start off with, on the first slide there, I hope you can see that I've listed um, exploitation and the different types of exploitation, just some of the main categories. So obviously you include adult or child exploitation. Adult exploitation is often referred to as uh, human trafficking or modern slavery. It can be sexual exploitation, at least we'll talk a little bit like that later. Uh, it can be criminal exploitation. That's often uh, county lines is the, the main example of that, where uh, individuals get sucked into committing criminal acts. It can be financial exploitation as well, where people's details, their uh, uh, financial accounts uh, are used. Um, so. Uh, they're just some of the key elements of exploitation that go on, um, and there are many others as well. Uh, onto my second slide now, so I can't see what's going on um, on the slides myself, so I'm talking through this blind. I just want to do, uh, put across here the, the sort of two levels of contextual safeguarding, because very much our police work is picking up in the second area, but to put it into context, and this is from the National Working Group on Exploitation, uh, the tier one safeguarding is uh, probably the stuff that certainly social workers and um, those working in social services more broadly will be aware of, where alongside the day-to-day -day safeguarding that professionals will do around uh, the familial and the household where young people and adults, vulnerable adults live, they're also thinking about the, some of the threats outside and dealing with that as part of dealing with the individual they're safeguarding. If we move on to the second slide. Tier two, contextual safeguarding, is where we start to focus a bit more on those extra familial contexts. So that's where the police can really come in, where uh, our role in policing public spaces and activity outside of the family can really have a big impact. And that's an area where we are increasingly focused on our work as we move forward. On to the next slide. Very broadly, Westbridge Police's approach follows a 4P approach which we recognise from other contexts, um, counter-terrorism being one of the key ones. So we do a lot of work in preparing and making sure that our resources are set up and ready to enable us to tackle exploitation in all its forms. That means a large part is training our staff, taking part in webinars like this to bring up the general knowledge in the community amongst professionals as to what's going on. Two major themes are around protect and prevent. These are similar, so I'll discuss them together. So protection is very much that safeguarding work that we do with partners around to protect the vulnerable. That's all children, but obviously there are vulnerable adults as well. Prevention is where we're trying to educate, and that's not just young people who are potentially going to be victims or adults who are potentially going to be victims, but it's also educating our communities around what to look out for, how to help us, prevent, how to help us protect and other partners, protect young people and vulnerable adults, and also how to report it if need be. And finally, very much the um, sort of enforcement end of uh, our approach to tackling exploitation is our pursue element, which is where we will focus on those people who are exploiting, the exploiters, the offenders, and uh, relentlessly pursue them to make their environment really hostile to what they're doing and to uh, ultimately prevent them and to stop them doing what they're doing if that involves um, court sentences and prosecutions and that's what uh, we can do as well. Okay, next slide. Just quickly I'll mention county lines, um, very much covered by Andy earlier on, but county lines is generally the ex exportation of drugs from urban areas out into more rural areas where the methods that uh, the drug users and the exploiters use are fairly unfamiliar and therefore can be more successful. This is a picture uh, from a national presentation, it shows the whole of the UK and as you'll be well aware already, the urban areas exported include the West Mids, not just Birmingham but Warsaw as well. 
um, locally we know there's lines that run out into Staffordshire, into Wales, down to the south coast and over to the east coast as well, uh, even up into Scotland. Um, <clears throat> so the next slides are one thing, three slides, just quickly going through what we're doing now about the lockdown situation. So first of all, during lockdown, we're obviously seeing reduced reporting referrals, reduced numbers of missing people originally, initially, at the start of lockdown, down by about 8%. But as a lockdown is reduced, obviously this is now going back up to normal levels. And of course, reduced levels of contact by professionals. Um, not only is the overall level of contact generally reduced, that's not just by us, but by social workers and other partners as well. But of course, that contact is often now remotely via phone or maybe web, and therefore that sort of rich source of information you can get by actually seeing a young person or an adult and seeing how they react and seeing the environment, seeing what they look like, how, how, how well kept they are. That sort of level of information is missing as well. So although we've had a reduction in those report or reports and referrals through, we believe this, this is just um, the activity still going on, but that it's hidden. So we are expecting, and we're starting to see as the lockdown redu reduces, we're starting to see a uh, increase in reports. And in reality, we're expecting to see a bit of a wave of uh, reported abuse and exploitation as the lockdown comes off. So at the moment during lockdown, as it's relaxed, <clears throat> three main ways we're working, but the same as before, but the balance has changed. So obviously we're still re working reactively and where we get people reported missing, we're seeking them, where we get referrals of exploitation, we're still investigating and responding to that. But as the numbers have been less, we've had more time. So one of the benefits, I guess, of the lockdown is that we've had more time to do proactive work, but we've really focused on uh, targeting with our uh, police enforcement activity, organised crime, and the people who are organising this exploitation, which has led to some operations um, and a number of fireworks and drugs being taken off the street and some hefty, um, uh, some hefty sentences being handed down or, or, or cases going to the courts that will lead to that. Finally, we're also looking towards this uh, increase in referrals and reports as the lockdown comes off. We are looking towards putting more resources and preparing our preventative work so as we can increase our development and increase our resources into early intervention and violence reduction work. And some of you may well have been aware of the great work that's been done with Warsaw College that we're now starting to roll out to secondary schools. So post lockdown, this is my last slide, post lockdown, <clears throat> we're looking at how we can support our best partners better in early intervention. We're looking at the moment at an internal advert going out to try and increase our PCSO resources actually working in early intervention, we can look like we can double that and hopefully even increase that further. Um, we're working at new ways of improving our contextual safeguarding at tier two in our neighbourhoods. So how we can make our neighbourhoods more aware of and more targeting the areas and the locations where the exploitation is occurring and the perpetrators. We're working very closely with our partners, especially in Katie's team, Jade and Inman, who you've just seen it, trying to develop a more uh, holistic and a more multi-agency collaborative model with describing as a hub model where we'll come together and work much more closely around these issues and coordinate our work to have a bigger impact. And finally, we're also reviewing all of our educational work, which was paused during the earlier part of the lockdown, to see how much of that we can use um, and deliver remotely, not just during lockdown periods, but how we can reach greater numbers of young people with our work in schools through providing a lot more either online or pre-recorded. So that's a quick oversight of where we're at with exploitation in uh, Walsall from the Westminster Police point of view. I'll now hand you over to Lisa Mullen from the PPU to talk about child sexual exploitation in particular. I've got to shoot off to another meeting now, so I will come back in about 30 minutes to help answer any questions at the end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for that. Um, so my name is Lisa Mullen. Um, I'm the CSE coordinator currently working from Warsaw. Um, I'd like to just cover um, specifically around child sexual exploitation. Um, so if you could go on to the next slide, please. So what is child sexual exploitation? <coughs> it's a form of child sexual abuse and it can occur where an individual or group take advantage of an imbalance of power to coerce, manipulate or deceive a young child or young person 
under the age of 18 into sexual activity. This can be in exchange for something the victim needs or wants and or for the financial advantage or increased status of the perpetrator or facilitator. The victim may have been sexually exploited even if the sexual activity appears consensual. Child sexual exploitation does not always involve physical contact and it can also occur through the use of technology. Mm -hmm. We're currently aware that um, Snapchat Premier accounts are being used. These are unregulated um, <coughs> private <coughs> accounts that are being held to um, exchange indecent images, videos in return for um, payments. There's also an increase in um, fan-based apps such as OnlyFans where you could have up to 10,000 subscribers each paying 10 pounds uh, a month. So it's a very lucrative business that is being almost like um, highlighted on the internet. So what I would suggest is following any um, the presentation, if you can go and have a look on Google and just Snapchat Premier accounts and just see exactly how these accounts work, uh, because I think that is a real threat to um, our young persons. If I can go on to the next slide, please. So the victim's views. The young person may not see themselves as a victim and they may claim to be acting voluntary. As such, getting the victims to cooperate with the police investigations can prove very difficult, but this is not impossible. What we have found is where we've had great success, it's where we've had longevity in key workers, <laughs> Um, and we found that that is key in assisting young people with the engagement with police. And I'll allude to several successful um, cases that we've had where we had good reduction in risks for children. And that has been down to key workers, i.e. street teams, supporting that young person all the way through the police investigation process. And that has been a real key thing for us from a police perspective. Just to remind everybody that you know, in reality, this can never be considered as consenting behaviour. This is child abuse. So, flip onto the police role, if I could go onto the next slide. So, safeguarding young children and young people from sexual exploitation, we do that via two interlinked strategies. The one that we aim at supporting the child or young person, and that would be through the uh, investigation process all the way through to court. And the other, and the most important, is aimed at disrupting and prosecuting the alleged abusers and also <coughs> targeting the location of concern. <coughs> so this is where everybody can play the part. Good information sharing across all partner agencies. Next slide, please. Is vital um, to the safeguarding of vulnerable children effectively. Effective early information sharing and intelligence <coughs> gathering can help build a coherent picture of risk sources and potential targets for abuse. It can also identify and support a child's need at the earliest opportunity in reducing the duration of harm and escalation to more serious abuse. This is really key. It can also help identify and understand links between different forms of exploitation and hidden or related crimes. You can identify locations being used for the purpose of exploitation and identify networks or individuals who pose a risk to children. You can provide evidence in applications to the court, civil and criminal orders. And these are all um, options that are available to us if we have the evidence or intelligence to support this from a police perspective. Now, one of the ways that we gather that information is from intelligence from key workers like yourselves. Um, this can be via a partnership sharing form that will sometimes be related, uh, referred to as a FIB form, that's F-I-B. That stands for our Force in Intelligence Bureau. These forms can be accessed via the Walls of Safeguarding Board website. And what intelligence is, is information. It's not where these forms are not to be used for a referral into police. Okay, so information that's intelligent, uh, useful to police. There's a list there, but 
um, also uh, vehicle details, including registrations, makes, models, or colours. If we think that somebody's going around selling drugs or taking children around, we have the use of what we call an AMPR, which is an automatic number plate recognition system. There's numerous sites um, up and down the motorway network and around our streets, so we can actually put markers on vehicles uh, so that we can plot where they're going or what route they've taken into a city or if they've gone out of city. So that's a really good um, source for the police. Train tickets or other re relevant travel documents, that will all be in intelligence to support that a child could be trafficked. Full descriptions including names or nicknames of suspected perpetrators. Details and descriptions of unusual or regular callers to children's homes phone numbers of suspected perpetrators or their associates, any email addresses and usernames where known, address details of suspected perpetrators or locations where regular parties are being held, anything like that. Um, details of addresses or localities that children are at risk of being exploited or maybe being taken to um, or where there's been suspicious activity. Areas where children associate out of sight, any unexplained gifts that have been received by children, reported missing episodes and any other absence from schools, and names of other children or young people that are friends with who could, um, they could also be at risk of exploitation. And this is key. One of the big things for us when we're looking at networks, Imran already alluded to the fact that we've had a, a meeting um, to try and map associates of people so if you're doing home visits or anything like that and there are people in the house that's good information for us that's good intelligence who are their current friend network we're not saying that they're up to anything but it's just showing us who they are currently associating with and then that helps build a richer picture now when intelligence reports are received into the police they'd usually come via the form that I've explained to you. They then get sent to our Force Intelligence Bureau who create what we would class as an IMS, that's an Information Management System, log. Once that log is created, the person who sends that information, so if that is yourselves, I as a police officer would not see where that information comes from. All I would see is a number, so we almost anomalize the information that's come in. You may not always get a response back from police to say that your information has been received, but you must be rest assured that if it has been sent into the Force Intelligence Bureau, it will get its way onto our information management system. And we will then look at that when we're looking at doing any kind of operations, taking out any kind of um, civil um, injunctions or anything like that, or police investigations. We may, somebody from for, the Force Intelligence Bureau may contact you if they need to clarify further information, but the more detailed information you can put on those forms, the better it is for us. So names, dates of birth, addresses, phone numbers, anything you can put on the forms, the more the better. Just finally, um, also listen to parents, because unlike other child abuse, often the parents have or hold key information about what the child is up to or what their children are up to and who is associating in that child's life. So to me, that is a key thing, is to listen to what parents have to say about the vulnerability of their own children. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lisa, um, and to Jamie. I think I do believe some people were experiencing a little bit of um, interference there, so I do apologise. I don't know whether there was a, a mic that wasn't um, switched off, so I was trying to contact people in the background. Um, just to make those aware that the link that's on the partnership information report of the that Lisa's just shared is has changed. So I'm going to post the new link on the chat, but I'll, before I send 
this um, presentation out, I'll make sure that that changes so you've all got where the, that form can be found. Lisa, just very one quick question um, around the forms while we're talking about them. Is somebody has said that they're still not able to send their intelligence forms via Squirrel Mail, so they know that that's an issue, um, but is that going to be resolved? Are we looking at having something that's sent directly or is it still got to come through the email address? Yeah, all the information would be sent through to the email address. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody having any issues, so I'm sure that if they are, I could press take that with our IT department because I don't know why that would be happening. OK, thank you. It might be, um, I know that the squirrel mail does get quite full up. Um, I take it, it doesn't say that this person's from a school, but it might be that if you're from a school, actually contacting um, ICT. So yeah, it would still have to be sent through through that avenue. OK, thank you for that. Um, so thank you to Jamie and Lisa for that police um, update. I'm now going to pass you over to Christine Jones, who is one of our named safe um, safeguarding nurses from Warsaw Healthcare Trust. So over to you, Christine. Thank you, Kellyanne. Um, hi, my name's Christine Jones. As Kellyanne said, I'm one of the, one of the um, known nurses for safeguarding children um, working within Warsaw Healthcare Trust. Um, if we just have the next slide, please, Kerry. Um, and so I'm just going to give a sort of a brief overview, really, of um, child exploitation and the response from health in Warsaw. It's going to be primarily focused around um, Warsaw Healthcare Trust because obviously that's the trust that I work in. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so just to give a bit of an overview about the trust. So Warsaw Healthcare Trust is the only provider of acute hospital services in Warsaw. It also provides a wide range of community services and provides health services to a population of approximately 260,000 people. So I think because we are the only provider of acute hospital services, it does put us in quite a unique position regarding children and young people who are exploited, who are actually accessing health services in Warsaw. Um, next slide, please. OK, just a brief overview of our team. Um, we do have a lead nurse for safeguarding children within the trust whose name is Lisa Robinson. And we also have um, a lead safeguarding adults nurse who is Jennifer Robinson. That's just um, the slide just demonstrates we have four, four named nurses, a named midwife, two nurse advisors, and we also um, are combined with the looked after children's team. Um, we have Donna Smith, Sarah Kirk um, and Jolene Crosdale, who are part of the looked after children's team who work very closely with us. And that's quite important because it has been demonstrated that um, quite a large um, percentage of our looked after children are the children that are at risk of exploitation. Uh, next slide, please. OK, um, so I'm not afraid to say it and I will admit it, but currently um, from looking at our records, health do submit a small number of referrals regarding child exploitation. And obviously this is a cause for concern for us as a healthcare trust and also from an overall health perspective. Um, within our safeguarding children's team, we do um, receive a copy of all the safeguarding referrals that are made by any member, staff member of Warsaw Healthcare Trust. Um, so, so we do have copies of all of the safeguarding referrals that are made. And obviously this puts our safeguarding team in quite a unique position to monitor safeguarding referrals from a health perspective in respect of child exploitation. Next slide, please. OK, in addition to that part of our work stream, the children's safeguarding team also contribute to the multi-agency safeguarding hub. 
Um, in respect of child exploitation, we have a named nurse or nurse advisor who sits each day within the MASH and obviously screens referrals that come in from a health perspective, sharing any health information that we may have on our systems or we have access to regarding child exploitation and individual victims. Um, we obviously work within the multi-agency safeguarding hub with our partners. Um, we take part in discussing thresholds and also have quite an active part in the strategy uh, strategy discussions um, when decisions are made regarding um, child protection planning. Next slide, please. So um, it's just some very brief sort of raw statistics, really. But in the months of April and May 2020, so obviously the two primary months of lockdown um, when it was probably at its most strictest, our safeguarding team reserve, received overall 76 safeguarding children referrals. And just to bear in mind, those, as I said earlier, are those are literally referrals, that safeguarding referrals made by any member of staff, the Warsaw Healthcare Trust. Obviously, we do accept that um, we may not receive every single refer a copy of every single referral, but that is the process that we've got in place. So um, staff should re should um, be aware that they need to send us a copy. And when I was just doing a little bit of um, sort of research for this presentation and to take part in the webinar, um, I was quite startled to find out when I looked back that actually only one of those 76 safeguarding children referrals was in respect of child exploitation. And another quite startling fact for me personally was that there were not actually any referrals regarding child exploitation from our A&E department, our community midwives or our sexual health services during these two months. I think it's important to recognise that that's not a criticism of those services. Um, I would suggest overall in A&E, we have actually seen a reduction of the amount of children attending A&E for a wide variety of reasons. We tend to get children coming in, you know, physical injuries, accidents, unwell, and those numbers do appear to have dropped quite significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that's probably um, the case across the country nationally in the fact that parents were probably a little more more reluctant to bring children into an A&E environment where they are aware that there could be COVID-19 patients. So I think we have to accept that it's not just a fact of that, you know, we're not recognising child exploitation, people, people are accessing services, but we're not recognising it as a trust. I think that's just one of the impacts of COVID-19 at this point in time. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So, and obviously, as I think we're all aware from um, news around COVID-19, the pandemic response, et cetera, um, from health services during the crisis, quite rightly, there has been focus, huge focus on management of the pandemic. Um, there's been a focus on capacity and preventing the NHS from being overwhelmed. These will all have had impacts as well on recognition of child exploitation. Um, and also, I think we have to be aware that staff, some of our healthcare staff have been redeployed to unfamiliar clinical areas, and that can be quite anxiety provoking for staff. Um, and it can lead to um, instances where staff may not have recognised child exploitation or indicators purely because, as I say, they've been redeployed to unfamiliar clinical areas. So I think we have to recognise that, you know, the impact of COVID-19 has been quite dramatic, really, on the NHS. Um, obviously, as I think um, other partners have alluded to in their presentations, a lot of what would normally have been face to face consultations have been taking place remotely. Our looked after children's team have been conducting health assessments remotely. Midwives have been completing some home visits, but a lot of the usual antenatal visits have been completed remotely. And as I say, as was mentioned by our partners, this can make it sometimes more difficult to actually spot the indicators of child exploitation. Um, next slide, please. Um, as we're all aware, and has been mentioned earlier in the webinar, um, we're, as I say, we are all aware incidences of child exploitation, or perhaps more importantly, incidences of child exploitation, the numbers we will recognise will increase. Um, 
how we as a health service and as also healthcare trust do need to address the low numbers of referrals um, and I think it's important for us probably as a safeguarding team um, to have a look back prior to the pandemic if we can all remember that far back and just to see if it was the case before the pandemic that we were um, making quite a low number really of safeguarding referrals with respect to child exploitation. From our safeguarding team's perspective, now hopefully we're coming out of lockdown and sort of taking over the peak of the pandemic. Um, within our team, it's been agreed that it's an ideal opportunity now to address exploitation from a health perspective in Warsaw. And obviously, as I think um, Jade alluded to earlier as well, we've got our um, exploitation hub that's coming online. So obviously health, um, you know, will we'll have a part to play in that working um, with our multi-agency partners. Uh, next slide, please. So just as I said, we've sort of I've sort of covered a little bit why I, I and our team believe that there have been fewer referrals from health around the remote working um, and obviously people less reluctant to access health services. But I think we also have to be aware as well that, um, you know, we have to look at whether it's due to a lack of professional curiosity. Um, this is something that has sort of um, been highlighted in um, some safeguarding uh, series case reviews for children, not just around child exploitation. So this is something that we feel we need to focus on as a team um, to make sure our practitioners are asking the right questions. So, for example, if children and young people are accessing A&E, is it being documented who they've arrived with, what the relationship of those individuals is to that child? It's all those sort of questions that, you know, need to be asked in order to get the right information and picture of what's happening for that child. Um, we also need to address whether there is a lack of recognition of indicators of child sexual exploitation. Could it be an unfamiliarity with screening tools? And, I, and as um, I think it was mentioned earlier, there is going to be a new screening tool um, coming online as well. So that's obviously something we as a team need to ensure that all of our staff members are, are, are fully conversant with how that tool works. And also, I think um, just in some of my contact um, with some of the departments within the trust, I think generally there is a more limited understanding of contextual safeguarding and the term contextual safeguarding. So that is something we're also going to focus on as a team. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so just um, as I say, just to talk about the action that we to improve health response and more specifically Warsaw Healthcare Trust's response. And um, we are planning to complete an audit regarding referrals um, prior to COVID-19. And obviously we're also been monitoring referrals with respect to child exploitation um, post lockdown. And we're aware we need to target actions in certain clinical areas. I think it's important to ascertain, ascertain a baseline with our staff um, just to see where we need to pitch our learning and training at, obviously to ensure that um, children and uh, young people receive the maximum support from health services that they can if they are victims or are, are at risk of exploitation. Uh, next slide, please. So currently, um, our team are responsible for delivering within the trust level one, two and three safeguarding children's training, which is a single agency training. We also provide an advice and guidance service regarding all referrals made by any staff member. So we run a duty line, which is um, open 8.30 till 4.30 Monday to Friday. And this is available for any staff member of Warsaw Healthcare Trust who would like advice, guidance or support with anything relating to safeguarding children or young people. Next slide, please. So our planned response moving forward, um, we're currently in the process of myself and one of my colleagues of developing a bespoke safeguarding children from exploitation training package. Um, I know from across the health sort of economy, um, we're going to be um, talking about child exploitation champions within departments, people with a specific interest in child exploitation, who can also almost act like conduits for some of the information that needs to be shared to improve our response. 
We as a team are providing micro training sessions around screening tools and obviously certainly will be with the new screening tool that comes online so that staff have the confidence to complete those tools and to provide the evidence for their referrals. We are also completing daily floor walks around our paediatric departments, maternity departments and A&E departments. Um, and obviously we're using that as an opportunity for ad hoc child exploitation awareness raising. And also as part of our um, statutory work streams, we do provide group and individual safeguarding supervision sessions for all our staff, which gives them the opportunity to bring along uh, exploitation cases they may have been involved with, just for opportunities for reflection and action planning. Next slide, please. So outcomes from the actions we've I've just discussed is what we want for Walsall Healthcare Trust staff is to have the confidence in recognising child exploitation, want them to have the confidence in taking the appropriate action, re making a safeguarding referral and offering support for that child or young person. And for ourselves as a safeguarding children's team, we need to be offering a continuous review and audit of referrals to ensure that all of the mechanisms I've discussed are actually supporting children and young people who are at risk or are victims of exploitation. Next slide, please. I think this is nearly the end. <laughs> yep, thought it was. Thank you, everybody, for listening. That's lovely. Thank you, Christine. Um, lots of information there, lots of things happening, lots of changes within health. So I hope people have found that really useful. Going to hand you straight over because I'm aware of time to um, Helen Matthews now who's going to give you the overview from Street Teams. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Kelly Ann said, my name's Helen Matthews and I'm the Chief Exec of Street Teams. And for those of you who don't know who Street Teams are, we've been the major, um, the main voluntary organisation in Warsaw since 1999 who've been responding to the issues of child exploitation. We started off primarily as a child sexual exploitation prevention charity and as a landscape, um, which you've heard from Andy and uh, our other partnerships today, as a landscape for exploitation change, so did our services. Kellyanne, if you could just flick to the next slide, please. So what we do at the moment is create really innovative approaches to how we respond to exploitation and a lot of that has been done with consultation by the local with the local community so we work with boys girls all ethnicities all sexualities and we do um, we have different services that I'll briefly talk you talk you through what our main difference is, is we mainly work we also work sorry up into the age of 25 so we wait, make sure that when a child reaches 18 they, they continue to get a service. I think we were quite frustrated with the fact that children at 18 seem to drop off the radar. We're aware that grooming doesn't stop at the age of 18 and we're really proud of our transition service. So we respond to all the connecting issues like criminal exploitation, cuckooing and rough sleeping sex workers, as well as having some really great projects for families, parents and siblings. Next slide, please. These are just some pictures of our um, response to exploitation. It's very much a community driven project. So we have 10 full-time face-to-face staff, 14 staff in total, and we make sure that we really embed ourselves amongst the communities we serve. So you can get in contact with us if you want any awareness sessions, if you've got a community that feels lacks some knowledge on exploitation, we can come and um, work alongside that community. We work in partnership very closely with the people that you've heard from today, police, health, education, faith sectors, even supporting a school on, on a litter pick. Um, talking about exploitation as we go along. So we're really proud of our service and please get in touch if you want some more information. As Andy's already alluded to, we're finding a massive spike in internet grooming um, and we make sure that a lot of, well, we don't make sure, a lot of the referrals we do receive offer some sort of internet safeguarding. And I'll talk to you about how you can refer after. So we're trying to prevent all forms of child exploitation. If you can flick to the two slides on please, Kelly. So our one-to-one -one work is a youth work-based model. So our, primarily for our primary focus is to build relationships. Um, our face-to-face -face work doing, um, during COVID has not stopped. I'm really proud of the way of our team has been out and about and doing our one-to-ones, PPE protected um, at a safe distance. What, what we wanted to make sure is that children and families 
haven't didn't see an increase in isolation. We wanted to be that safety network for them. We wanted to make sure that other safety networks, obviously like school and some work had stopped. So we wanted to provide um, that relationship still. So we've still been out and about. Uh, and as I say, it's to build trust, raise the awareness, and also support that child and the family through the journey. Um, exploitation is the most is the most abhorrent crime, and we're just there as an ear um, and working with our partners to obviously hopefully aid in prosecution of offenders. We also have a quite um, a robust prevention education program. So on average, we deliver probably between um, to students probably between about ten thousand and fifteen thousand sessions a year um, to individual students. These sessions are tailor made to the school, the age the youth work setting, the PRU, um, the youth club. So we do lots of sessions on um, internet grooming, what child sexual exploitation is, what criminal exploitation is, um, sometimes on what radical ra radicalisation is, and also the harmful influence of pornography. What we are trying to do, because a common factor between all of those is grooming. So we're, what our, we're trying to do now is make sure that our sessions have a, a, a larger focus on grooming and it's really important for children to recognise if they're being groomed but also if, they're, if they can recognise that other people in their class or their social network are being groomed and we really talk them through what happens, what happens, what the process is within Warsaw um, and how people can support them. If you're from different agencies today, if you can flick on a few slides please. If you're from an agency today that feels you need a little bit more information on what criminal exploitation is or child sexual exploitation is, we offer awareness raising programmes to professionals. So you can either access those through the Warsaw Council training um, offer, or you can come directly to ourselves and we'd be happy to come out, our team would be happy to come out and talk about what exploitation is um, and, you, and, and how to sort of tailor your response to that. So please get in touch if that's um, something you feel you would benefit from. As I've mentioned, a main part of our work is community work and we don't just work um, we work in a wider community, sorry. We've had several really creative projects that have worked particularly with the BAME network. We've done some wonderful awareness raising and partnership with our local mosque, our Gurdwaras, um, our local supermarkets. And we're quite proud of some of the um, safeguarding concerns that after our training, um, staff um, have, have, been, have been able to raise. So if you feel that you need some more information on that, please get in touch. Um, our brand new project is Community Futures. Now, this project has been given a five-year lottery grant, and this is to engage certain communities that we feel needed some support. The main, the main goal with Community Futures is to try and upskill communities so they become more resilient. And, and actually, we want communities to say, actually, exploitation is not going to happen um, in our area. So we're looking at working with families. We're looking at raising, raising awareness with every community member in that, our first area that we've chosen is Blockswidge. We'll be um, really pushing um, education for children, primary school, um, secondary school and parents and creating a campaign. You can see the new logo on your screen now. So we really want people to take on board the fact that exploitation happens and, act, and they have a responsibility. A responsibility is a community member within Warsaw. So you might see some information come through doors. And we've got new staff members out at the moment that are trying to engage the community. Obviously, coronavirus stopped play for a while, but a lot of the work has been done online. So we, we, we're managing to build that relationship um, with the Bloxwich area. So you'll start to see more of that. Um, as I mentioned in um, when I first started, our transition project offers seamless support for vulnerable young people um, who have been identified or abused as um, CSE or criminal exploitation victims. And that one-to-one -one support um, sort of helps them in that transition period to adulthood. We do a lot of work in semi-supported accommodations um, and we realise obviously that you don't stop being a victim at 18 but we have to be also mindful that apart, you know, as a partnership the laws and the legal framework change post 18. So we very much still see um, that child or young person as a victim. So if you've got any young people who, who, are, who are in that transition age, age period you can refer through to street teams and we'll be able to pick up some one-to-one -one work um, with those as well. Um, can you flick on a couple, please? We have a successful programme called Community Champions. We have probably 60 young people who have been um, trained and educated over 12 weeks and, and they learn to be champions. So they're out and about as, as many street teams workers, really, really um, championing the issue of exploitation in the area, 
talking to their community groups, talking to other young people and trying to spot if exploitation is happening. And then they, are, they know all of the safeguarding response and how to refer it into um, our local partnership. So um, the champions can come and do talks to your young people. They're, everything that we deliver is free of charge. So please get in touch if you would like to, um, you know, to make use of that service. And when I mentioned Community Futures earlier, we're also recruiting for new volunteers. So these volunteers will be adult volunteers and they'll be working on the same basis in the area. And if you look at some of our social media posts, you'll be able to see if that's something that you'd like to be involved with. Next slide, please. Um, Lisa mentioned earlier that sometimes parents are our real missing gap in terms of exploitation. And, and we felt that parents had been wrongly, in some cases, blamed for not protecting their children against exploitation. And in fact, they were just lost. They didn't know what to do. They really lacked support. Um, and obviously, it's a very frightening and scary time for a parent if your child is being groomed. So we have two wonderful staff that work on our Parents and Siblings project, and they provide emotional support and a, 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 a listening ear um, and comfort to families who are going through this. The creative thing about this project is that I think a lot of people missed the siblings in all of this process. And we felt that siblings were being, they had an increased vulnerability just to, because nobody was working with them. So we make sure that these people, uh, parents, sorry, and siblings have their own worker. It's not the same worker as, um, as the child that's being exploited. And what we do is we really just have a great relationship with parents and talk them through the process talk them through why this is happening, talk them through why the child might be running away. We get the parents to understand trauma bonding. We're consistent in our approach. And I think that's what parents need at that time. Um, and you can refer parents through to us as well. Next slide. Our New Beginnings project is for adult rough sleeping sex workers. And this is commissioned by um, Warsaw Council, uh, their housing team. And our main job is to house 10 um, rough sleeping sex workers a year um, into flats that Accord have provided, but really to, main, to make sure that they um, can become active citizens. And we sort out the referrals into the Beacon. The Beacon has been fantastic in, um, in working closely with us. And we make sure that we look at intervention, engagement, stabilisation, but more so recovery. So what, you know, have they got any childhood trauma that we, we need to identify? Um, what support do they need? So you can also, if you if you do identify anybody that fits that category, please speak to um, Housing First, and they'll be able to arrange a referral. Um, very, you know, in, in a nutshell, that's what street teams do. But uh, you know, we, we respond to need, we respond to what's um, going on in the community, and we want to make sure that every child has access to a service. So um, please get in touch. Uh, we want now all referrals to go through to the missing uh, and exploited children email. Um, we're trying to, we're not stopping direct referrals to ourselves, but we feel, we feel like because we're moving into such a wider partnership um, range, we want to make sure that we're part of that partnership and Warsaw Council has been great in involving us in part of that partnership. So we want all referrals to go into the central hub and, and as other presenters have alluded to, we'll be part of that hub and we'll be part of that screening process. So we'll know which right referrals, um, which, which are the right referrals for us and what, what are the right referrals for the partners. So, yeah, just drop us an email or get in touch with us after if you'd like any more information on Street Team. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, guys, we are going to run over slightly. Uh, we are going to carry on the presentation, the webinar, though. We really hope you can continue. If people do have to leave because of other commitments, we are recording this. Therefore, you will be able to access the part that you've missed at a later date. Um, so, and I'll send that link through to you. But I just think there's so much going on around exploitation at the moment. And I think just through the sheer number of people who have joined us, there's lots of useful information. So, um, we hope you you are able to continue with us but if not then we have recorded this therefore it will get put on um it will get put onto the website i'm going to now hand you over to mike collier who is um from warsaw for all so mike would you like to talk us about to us about warsaw for all yeah sure so good morning everyone thank you for the invite so my name is mike collier and i'm a project manager one of three project managers for warsaw for all um, to let you know a little bit about Warsaw for All, we're a, a project that's government funded. There's five other projects across the, the country, which are Bradford, Blackburn and Darwin, Peterborough, 
and Waltham Forest. And the aim of our project is to look at integration and cohesion uh, in, in Walsall. If you can move on to the next slide, please. So our strapline, if you like, is around engaging, enabling and empowering, which is great when you're not in the middle of a pandemic because you can actually get out and meet local people within communities and talk. Um, since um, COVID-19 has caused a bit of a lockdown, we've had to look differently at how we've worked. And so our priorities are around um, connecting uh, across communities. So bringing people together from different areas and um, celebrating um, similarities and differences, um, working and contributing together. So a lot of our work is around working with local businesses and factories and firms around how integrated are they within um, the area that they're working with? How many local people do they actually employ? Living together, quite often we find that um, the t some of the tensions aren't amongst areas that are miles apart, but um, some of the difficulties are with um, families that live in neighbouring streets that have had issues that have gone on for generations and generations. And so part of our work is around how do we bring integration into these situations that have lasted for maybe years and years. And finally, the, the priority that I want to focus on uh, more today is around young people learning and growing together. And what I'd like to do is just share some of the projects that we're currently involved in, some of the projects that we've been involved in since the pandemic, and some of the projects that we're looking towards the, the future after COVID-19. So if I can have the next slide, please. So, as I said already, our work is around young people learning and growing together. And so I've named just four projects that I'm proud of, that I've been a part of over the last year and a half. So the first project that I'd like to talk about is School Linking. So the School Linking programme originated from uh, Bradford and the idea is that you get um, primary school and secondary schools and you pair them off. So you pair primary school with a primary school and a secondary school with a secondary school and these are from different communities. So we pair different age groups off. So we've had year threes uh, over in Palfrey, meet year three over in Blaknell. Uh, we've also had secondary schools, so Blue Coats have met up with uh, Blotsbridge Academy and the idea is that they meet three times a year, the first time on neutral territory and then the, the two other times they visit each other's school and they take part in, in an activity or a lesson in those schools and the idea is that through the activities young people begin to mix and talk and, and share the differences and similarities, hopes, dreams, aspirations. Our second project is UNICEF rights respecting schools, which we've adopted across Walsall. And so this is about UNICEF, our school signing up to, to UNICEF and saying, yes, um, as a school, we believe that young people have rights and that those rights should be heard. But alongside that, there's responsibility that young people need to take on board uh, as well. And so UNICEF at the moment, we're working with around about 24 schools, a mixture of primary and secondary schools. Um, and we're looking at ways in which we can do this creatively as well due to COVID-19. Uh, the Youth Voice Commission. So we've got four commissions that we've set out um, to work with local communities. Um, we've got community dialogue, which is aimed at adults and um, young adults. And the idea is to bring people from different areas together to speak about their communities and then be raised up as um, champions. Uh, the next one is around hate crime and about how in Walsall people report hate crime. Is it an easy way to do it? Is it a hard way to do it? And how um, we can make and put those processes in place so that people feel comfortable to report hate crime. And also to understand what hate crime is, um, welcome packs is another aspect that we're working towards for, for newly arrived communities and for families that are, are new to, to Walsall. And the idea behind this is just simple information within maybe a language that they understand that they can then read and find out where the local GPs are, 
where Walsall Football Club is and how much the tickets are, if they want to go see football, where the local youth centres are, and basically what's out there for newly arrived communities. And then the fourth part is working with um, partners. So we worked with National Citizen Service, the Prince's Trust, and the idea around that is to identify young people that maybe don't usually get involved with the Na National Citizen Service and mentor them and advocate for them to be part of that, that process. And likewise with the Prince's Trust aimed at sort of um, older teens about getting them into, into work and employment and, and study. Uh, if we can have the next slide, please. So what has Well Software all been doing during COVID-19? So some of the things that we've been doing is around supporting families through the local community response hub. So we've had teams that have gone out that have packed food and, and delivered them to the hubs for families to come and, and collect. During the early stages of um, COVID-19, what we did was we realised that within Walsall, uh, one specific community maybe weren't getting the message um, and that was the deaf community at first when uh, the Prime Minister was doing his daily talks. We realised that there wasn't a BSL um, person. So what we did was we created uh, leaflets for, for the deaf community so that they were up to date and still are up to date with what's going on. Also videos in different languages so that people could see the, the urgency and the impact that COVID-19 was having and also demything some of the rumours that was going around as, as well. And this didn't just include videos, it included leaflets being posted through people's doors and being put up in areas where people congregated. Also part of our work was, uh, is still around monitoring tensions within communities and working accordingly. So we've been doing some work in communities supporting BAME um, families that have been target for um, uh, hate crime etc and also one of the things that we've been able to do is provide activity packs for young people and families and so these activity packs were specifically aimed at 13 to 18 year olds we found that there was a lot of activity packs going out for primary school children but we really wanted something that could reach and grab the attention of, of young people and families and doing things together and so we delivered around about 950 activity packs to families and young people across Walsall so far. Can I have the next slide please? So some of the things that we've been doing within communities um, online, we've been working with a, an organisation called Urban Hacks and we've been looking at, at um, creative writing classes and co collecting um, stories from different cultures and what's been quite interesting about this is uh, we've been doing it through uh, Zoom and we've actually found that people are starting to share stories but not just adults but children are starting to contribute to that as well. Um, ESOL has had to go online and yet again we found um, that it's been a very creative way of um, teaching the English to, to families. One, one of the uh, partner organisations that we work with is an organisation called Creative Factory who are based in the Butts community and they've been doing a lot of art within their community, a lot of chalk drawings on, on walls and different ways of um, creating rainbows and then putting up in the windows. Um, we've also been supporting uniform gr groups. There's over 35 different uniform groups within Walsall, um, all of whom, because of lockdown, can't meet with their young people. And so we've been looking at how we support their online presence during lockdown as well. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so the main piece of work that people can still refer into is uh, Walsall's for All um, Youth Voice or Youth Ambassadors programme. Uh, this is a programme for young people 13 to, to 19 or up to 25 with learning, learning needs. And the idea of the programme is to 
uh, work with young people to help them to realise that they've got a voice, but not only a voice, but also um, that their voice can and should be heard. And so how this is working during COVID-19 is that um, we've commissioned the National Youth Agency to do this piece of work and, the, and they're currently delivering this um, piece of work online during COVID-19. Young people get support, which is really crucial, uh, from qualified youth workers um, who will act as mentors for, for young people. And the crucial thing is it's not just listening to young people, but supporting young people to be a voice for themselves and others. So this is a social action project. So young people have come with uh, ideas of what they are passionate about and what they want to do. And as part of that, they get a uh, hundred pound to start off their social action project. And how we're looking to work this is that it will become online to start off with. So it will be an online social action project. But the legacy that we want to leave with young people is how they then deliver what they're passionate about in their local community. And this is a programme that people can still refer into. If can have the next slide, please. So like what's already been said already, um, we have realised that lots and lots of young people are starting to go online a lot more. And so what we've done is we've partnered with a, a, a youth organisation called Kicksters or Kick FM. And the idea behind this work is that we want it to create a safe online platform for young people to talk to youth workers, but not just to talk to youth workers, but also to get involved in say online gaming, uh, to get involved in sort of fun activities uh, as well. And so We've uh, paid Kicksters to create a, a safe online platform for young people to talk to youth workers, but also to get involved. Um, the other way that this works is that uh, if you are a professional, you can get in touch with Kicksters and you can also, if you like, rent some time on their, on their online platform to talk to groups of young people, which would just be uh, a time for you and the young people that, that you're working with. So we've created this safe online platform so that uh, young people can, can have fun during lockdown, but also learn and share their anxieties, hopes and fears. If we can have the next slide, please. Okay, so when it comes to uh, exploitation, um, from a Walsall for All perspective, this has been an, an area that we haven't really looked at up until recently. And now we're starting to work with um, social work teams and the way that we're doing this is um, we're looking at um, explaining sort of the differences within communities. So we're going to team meetings and explaining about the communities that they're working in and with families and young people that they're working with. So we're working with social work teams in a way that helps them to understand um, communities in, in Warsaw. Uh, my background's in, in youth and community work. And so one of the things that we are able to offer is one-to-one -one support for young people that are either medium or high risk victims of exploitation. And the way that we, we, we do that uh, is a uh, number of ways. The first way is that uh, we use a, a local centre to do some one-to-one -one work uh, with, with young people. So in doing this, uh, the centre's actually got status to be able to allow people in to do this work. So the way that we do this is looking at uh, maybe needs of young people. The other piece of work that we do is via Zoom or Skype or WhatsApp. And we've got a number of, um, if you like, professionals that are involved in spoken word or rap uh, or graffiti art. And what we do is uh, we do a Zoom or a Skype or WhatsApp meeting with um, with young people around the, the topic that they're interested in. And we find that in working with young people in a more relaxed uh, environment, um, that they, they open up a lot more and are able to share a, a lot more about what's going on in their lives, not just around exploitation, but around their hopes and dreams and fears. Okay, if we can have the next slide, please. Okay. So final slide, um, what next? So we're going to continue to support 
uh, through one-to-one -one work with young people at risk of exploitation. That's something that um, is ongoing. Um, referrals come through um, Rita Homer, who's a team manager at um, uh, Children's Services. Um, we're also working with communities and in communities a lot more. Um, as we've walked through certain areas, we've talked to young people and we've had conversations for like 50 minutes to an hour. And the response after that has been something to the effect of, if we hadn't come out and talked to you, bearing in mind social distancing, uh, I'd have been at home and I'd have been arguing with my brother or sister or mum or dad. And so we're starting to have a bit more of a presence within communities. Uh, also working with partners in a, a restorative way uh, to get the point across of what how communities are developing and changing and working with and supporting innovation groups. So innovation groups are, are smaller groups and organisations that do some good work within communities. And what we're looking to do with these groups is create bespoke work with young people. So starting where young people are at rather than um, thinking this is where young people are and, and hearing from them and then creating pieces of work that, that they're into, that they're interested in but also finding out from them what their hopes and dreams are. And I think that's it from me. Thank you, Kellyan. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Mike. Lots of um, work happening with young people at Warsaw for All there. So thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, so I'm going to hand you over now to Nicola Smith and Emma Holder, who are from um, Adult Social Care, who are going to talk about exploitation from um, an adult perspective. Thanks very much, Kellyanne. Afternoon, everyone. Um, the last section of today's webinar is to look at exploitation within an adult social care context. Um, so I think, as Kellyanne's just alluded to, um, to that this one will be a bit of a double act. Um, you'll be hearing from myself in the main to discuss overall content. So my name is Nicola Smith. I'm an advanced practitioner for adult safeguarding working within Warsaw Council. Um, you'll also hear from my colleague Emma Harper, who is also an advanced practitioner within one of our locality teams. Um, I'll be delivering a lot of the overall content. Um, Emma will actually be discussing a particular case example where adult social care has supported an adult that's subject to exploitation. So hopefully the case example will put some of the content that I cover um, into some sort of a practical context. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so it's just to stress as, as a, a first point, really, that as much as probably within the public consciousness when exploitation is mentioned as a concept, um, people often equate that to being relevant to children and young people. But it's just to stress that exploitation can occur at any point across the age spectrum. So it's as equally an important a concept to consider when practising with adults um, and family contexts. Um, again, the, the definition there of exploitation, I'm not going to read out to you because you can see it for yourselves. It's just to say that that's taken um, from our West Midlands Regional Adult Safeguarding Procedures. So all statutory um, safeguarding work within the region is governed under those particular procedures. So essentially what that tells us is exploitation is where a person or persons will um, undertake a particular action to profit in some way, shape or form. Um, it's just to say as well, um, within a wider legal context, those of us that work in statutory adult safeguarding, um, our legal duties are outlined under the Care Act 2014. Um, within that, there are specific categories of abuse or neglect that are named. There are 10 of them for those of us that work in adults. Um, it's just to make clear, exploitation is not listed as a defined category of abuse or neglect, but that is for a very good reason. Um, it's more that exploitation is actually an umbrella term that can permeate any any one or more of the concerns that we deal with so it's just stressing the need for us all to be very very vigilant to the potential presence of exploitation in practice so if we can have the next slide please um, so it's just to give a little bit of an overview of some of the concerns that we receive within adult social care where there is an exploitation issue present again this is not an exhaustive list it's just to give you a little bit of a flavour. Um, what I'll also highlight is there are a couple of areas where we've seen a slight spike in referrals post COVID and lockdown, and just to give it an explanation around that. 
So first of all, um, cookering. Um, this has been discussed by some of the previous presenters. Um, essentially, it's where a person or persons will infiltrate a vulnerable adult's property to use it as a base for criminal activity. So often it can be distribution of drugs or potentially sex work. Um, that's very relevant from an adult's perspective because obviously the adult whose home is being infiltrated may be at um, additional safeguarding related risks. Um, modern slavery and human trafficking, that's been briefly mentioned already, but again, that's something that we need to be very aware of from an adult's as well as a children's perspective. So essentially that will be where an adult is subject to some form of slavery, um, servitude or forced labour. Um, and human trafficking is the actual action whereby a person is trafficked into the country or the setting for the specific purpose of forcing them into some sort of an um, exploitative um, situation. Financial and material exploitation, again, that may be where a person or persons um, will be in contact with a vulnerable adult. Um, they will then potentially gain access to either the adult's money, um, property or possessions for exploitative purposes. Sexual exploitation um, is again where somebody is subject to some form of an exp um, exploitation within um, a sexual relationship type context. Um, the next two I really want to flag up um, domestic abuse and um, infiltration from so-called doorstop tradespeople. These are two areas where we've seen a spike in referrals, both within Walsall, but within the West Midlands region um, post COVID. Um, there may be a number of reasons for that. First of all, domestic abuse. Again, if somebody is within um, a domestic abuse situation, they can be exploited in a number of ways. So physically, sexually, financially. Um, there may potentially be a reason for a spike in referrals because with the lockdown situation, um, unfortunately, that will often mean that the adult is in a situation with the source of risk 24 seven with no way of escaping that because of the lockdown rules. Also, it may be that the potential protective factors, so professional support or the contact from family reduces because of the measures. So that that's led to a sort of a spike in referrals. Also doorstep tradespeople, that is essentially people who are capitalising on the needs of vulnerable people in the current situation. So that's manifested itself in um, situations such as people knocking doors and, and posing to be a shopping service. So they will take the person's money and shopping list and then not return with the goods. That's occurred in situations like people posing as, as bogus COVID testing services or bed delivery services. So those are things to be really aware of. Um, the last two, sometimes people may be referred to adult social care because it's thought that they're either being neglected or are self-neglecting, but actually additional lateral checks can reveal that the neglect of the person by another individual may be under the umbrella of exploitation. Um, the last one, self-neglect, I think that will be typified quite well within the case study. So sometimes adult social care can be advised that there's concerns about a person self-neglecting, but actually it may be that an exploitation situation is meaning that the person isn't able to maintain their personal welfare or, or maintenance of their property because of that. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Again, just to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the possible responses to um, a situation whereby an adult or adults are subject to exploitation. Again, not an exhaustive list at all, just to give you a bit of an idea. Um, if um, a, an adult safeguarding concern is made to the local authority. Um, the local authority will apply the Section 42 legal duty, which I'll come on to a little bit later. But if that legal duty is met, we will undertake a statutory safeguarding inquiry and potentially a safeguarding plan. It's just to flag up that the focus on that isn't automatically um, eradicating or presenting risks. Very much the focus is engaging with the person and supporting them to both establish and determine their achieve outcomes. Also, what we can do as a local authority is potentially complete a care and support assessment or review. That may be because we find that the adults needs for care and support may be exacerbating their um, vulnerability to exploitation. Um, so an assessment may help to reduce that. Also, potentially, um, it may be, so for example, if somebody leaves a domestic abuse situation, it may be that the source of risk 
ha- actually had a caring role for this person. So we may need to look at alternative ways to support them um, away from that exploitation context. And that would be done within the context of a support plan as stated there. All the sorts of options include the use of equipment and technology to enable people to feel safer. I just want to flag up the point about information and advice and guidance. That's really important. Sometimes the adult may not understand that they are being exploited, um, but also if they do, they may not know what options there are available to them. So providing information, advice, advice, guidance and education is really important to empower that person within that context. Um, again, referrals to and collaboration with other agencies. I mean, that list isn't an exhaustive one. It's just to give some examples. And I think what the research will often tell you is, particularly in really complex situations, the key to achievement of good outcomes is collaboration with multi-agency partners. Also, the last point is engagement with local communities. I think you'll probably see that one illustrated in the case study as well. Essentially, that doesn't mean that the local um, local community are, are there to respond to and manage the concerns as such, but raising awareness and education in the local community. One can make sure that people are vigilant and can make us aware of concerns in relation to exploitation, but local communities can also serve a protective function um, for the adult within that. And I'm now going to hand over, so next slide, but this will be to hand over to Emma Harper to go over the, the case example. OK, hi all. Um, thanks very much, Nicola. I'm not sure how much more I can add to that because Nicola's just given my whole example away, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but what, it is, what we wanted to do is there's been so much information provided, a wealth of services and knowledge within the local community that we utilise. So what we wanted to demonstrate through a practical example of exploitation is how we can utilise the multi-agency approach to really support people who are at risk of or are being exploited. Um, so within the context of adult social services, um, all referrals come through to the Access Centre. Now, for adults, in this case, it was a, an older male adult referred for a Section 42 concern for self-neglect. But the pertinent point to really focus on is that we need to achieve consent from the person who's been referred in for that referral to be made, especially if we, there is no reason to suspect any kind of diagnosed cognitive impairment. So as an adult, he has rights and responsibilities to say yes or no to any such referral. In this case, we, we couldn't make initial contact, so we utilised the housing provider and their support worker who made the referral for the safeguarding concern. And essentially, we did manage to achieve safe complaint, um, consent and complete a, a joint visit. Now, that was really pertinent because we didn't know this gentleman at all. all. All the information we had at that time was an older adult male. And upon the, what I would really recommend for this instance, for the social worker who was really kind of vigilant of the environment. So a point, at the point of accessing the property, it was evident that the property needed significant repair work. It was evident that there was lacking in any kind of cooking facilities or whiteboards appliances and that there was evidence of alcohol usage in the property and suspected um, of a substance use within the property. There was, the gentleman himself was very affable and amiable and willing to engage, but a reticence to kind of really dig deep and talk about some of the issues he was facing. And one of the areas we were really overtly concerned about was the fact that there was two people in the property in the bedroom who were referred to as friends, but did not engage or partake in the discussions. So I think there's an element of being sensitive and awareness of your role and you can't push. So what we did was built up a rapport and professional relationship over the course of several weeks, to be honest with you. And it wasn't until the point in which um, the, the friends were no longer in the property and the Section 9 assessment commenced that what we became overtly aware of is the fact that this gentleman was indicating that he felt lonely and isolated since the death of his wife. Um, 11 months ago and had no friends or family in the area but also that he had been befriended by this by a lady at a local shop when he was struggling to purchase some goods and that befriending became more and more kind of he said eventually it was intrusive to the point where they actually her and her associate actually went to stay for a few days which and then never left um, there was instances where known associates were coming to the property day and night. He was eventually moved out of his bedroom to sleep in an armchair. There was illegal activities taking place within the property. 
and in terms of achievement of well-being as per the care act he wanted to feel safe and secure and he wanted these people to leave with um for, for our perspective obviously we recognized that this wasn't self-neglect the reason he had no appliances was that the people who was accessing his property were stealing them selling them removing them his debit card had been taken from him so he couldn't replace the the, um, the, the goods and actually at a late date we established that his bank account was now empty and he was overdrawn his physical health was deteriorated because he no longer had access to his medication because they were being collected by his new friends and his associates and the, 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 the work we had to do really in terms of information advice and education and guidance was actually recognizing that they weren't his friends although he had a, a, such an affinity towards them because obviously they had supported him at a time in need but now that had turned into fear and isolation and fear of reprisals if he asked them to leave so actually this was where we had to really work hard with the housing provider who engaged the legal department to get the people evicted and we actually incorporated the with the consent of the service user the police where they presented they complete their own criminal investigations and introduced things like equipment and work with the banks etc now the couple were known already they had a history of cuckooing which is what this was and actually um, they were arrested on numerous occasions prior to this and actually during this incident and released on bail however that never stopped it it actually within three days they returned to the property but what was really essential really within this process is that the community and the community was seeing what was happening they were aware of the people and actually with consent the police and the housing provider linked in and it was actually the neighbours who managed to help with the apprehension of these people who were breaching their bail convictions. Um, from a local authority perspective, we really worked hard with the gentleman to increase his access to the local community and help him develop social support networks. We liaised with the GP and the, and his medic and the pharmacy. We also helped with him to learn how to complete activities of daily living because he himself would identify that he'd been wrapped up in cotton wool by his wife and didn't have a clue about how to do things like paying the bills etc but we also helped to provide like an educative function and gave him resources regarding what is exploitation what are the high risk groups and obviously over a course of time he he began to see for himself and actually what it did was improve his resilience and his determination to actually move away from this situation so he wasn't self-neglecting as per the initial referral but rather he, because of the explo exploitative nature of what was happening around him he was unable to meet his basic needs and daily living needs and to achieve well-being now the community the local community then became his safe place as such so he would go and visit friends so we had to work with a risk enabled perspective he didn't want to leave the property at that time but what we really wanted to focus on was the, the, the essential element of is exploitation doesn't happen in isolation it happens over a period of time your community is usually your eyes and ears of the activity that's going on so we need to engage and not be afraid to ask questions but obviously we need to be aware of confidentiality um for this gentleman in particular his his own kind of mental health and physical health deteriorate to the point where things like counseling services were provided he became he, he gathered new friends in the local community and actually the couple themselves were were arrested and charged with a number of offences which was a positive outcome in terms of maintaining the safety of other people within the area because they were they were very well known to services already um, so it's really just about recognizing that exploitation doesn't happen in isolation it is an umbrella term for a, num a multitude of safeguarding concerns and actually this isn't an exhaustive account the support that we provided and multiple agencies and the community provided wasn't over a period of days it was over a period of weeks and months to be honest with you so i think we have to work with people at their own pace and recognize that we can't enforce our own opinions but we have to support people to develop their own and make their own choices to express autonomy and control um, for him the achievement of safety and being happy was achieved over a longer period of time um, so what he actually did do in the end was that he, what he really wanted to do was go. Oh, sorry. When he did meet, make make new friendships, and he actually decided to move and leave the area. So the preventative element of the local authority was to continue to support with him identifying accommodation, working with the banks and the GP, etc. And that gentleman is now happy. He now has no formal support, no commission services in place. He's aware of what exploitation is. He's aware of how to mitigate risks. 
and he now takes positive risk and admit steps so he's aware and he can make choices based on his experiences and the information he's been provided. Like I say it's not an exhaustive account because it, it, this took place over many many months but if anyone would like any further information or anything I can help with please you'll have my direct contact numbers. Um, you pass me on to the next slide please. Yep. So um, just to end really this is a bit of a whistle stop please get in touch with us in future. Um, if you would like to make a referral into adult social care, you'll see the numbers there. Um, we have a, there are set time frames within the, I don't know if Nicola wants to go through this a bit closer in terms of the, the response times, but that is a 24 hour line, so you can call for it any time. The, the only last thing I would like to say is I think it's again, um, in terms of we have a single point of access for all adult safeguarding referrals within Walsall, and there are the access teams details. I think it's just to stress, as Emma said, if we are referring any potential concerns to adult social care, we should be making the person, having an open and honest conversation, making the person aware of what our concerns are and seeking their consent to make a referral if at all possible. Um, again, it was also to say that the access team are also there. If sometimes people can say, well, I'm not sure whether to refer or not, there can be that open dialogue with the access team to determine that. And just last but by no means least, it's just to say any um, concerns received by the local authority in terms of adult safeguarding. I did mention earlier it, we apply our Section 42 duty. So it's there is a set criteria to look at to see whether we proceed to a statutory safeguarding inquiry under Section 42 of the Care Act. But again, if any additional information is wanted by any of any of the attendees, then I'm happy to provide that at a later date. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Nicola and Emma. So that is the end of our um, agencies doing their presentations. Just like to thank each and every one of you um, for sharing all the information with you. I know we've completely overrun, but I just think there's so much stuff happening out there in Warsaw with um, children, young people and their families around exploitation. And um, we've had this ideal opportunity to, to share. And we've still got a lot of people with us today on the webinar. So it's great that you, you were able to remain with us. Um, just a few questions then for our uh, panelists who have, uh, that have come in. Um, I think this is probably, this first one's probably aimed at either Imran or street teams. Um, Helen or Andy might be able to mention this, but Paul has asked, how is all um, the knowledge shared with foster carers, residential social workers and all who look after vulnerable children? So sort of our data and our stats and things like that, how do we how do we kind of get that information out there to our foster carers or residential social workers? Do you want me to answer that, Helen, or, or do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think it's something for you, Amra Imran, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I probably, yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, Jay, please um, yeah, um, I think, uh, chip in. But I think we've got a we've got a foster care team within the social service um, wider team. So, you know, the, the, the kind of training, the, the, the uh, practice, the policies, the procedures, they are cascaded through to the foster care team in in the same way that we 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 cascade other information to foster care team the social work team are seen as a very essential part um of of the looked after team so that that so that would be my response so you know then yeah. there's an expectation on um social workers who who work with foster carers to kind of work with foster carers to embed that learning jade is there anything more you want to add yeah i think obviously um you know uh, we are aware that um, so foster carers, with regards to foster carers, that we could improve um, the knowledge that they are getting with regards to particular children who may be at risk or um, who are victims of exploitation. I think that's something that um, we may need to look into. I do know that previously what we have said is kind of um, for individual children in individual cases, um, when exploitation concerns are identified for a young person, <clears throat> um, the allocated social worker would then complete the screening tool. I think it's absolutely crucial for the um, allocated social worker to then um, disseminate that screening tool to the foster care of social worker so that this foster care of social worker can work closely with the um, allocated uh, with the foster carer to um, safeguard that child. I think 
also um, from an exploitation team's perspective at any point whether it's a foster carer social worker um, or the foster carers any any kind of guidance or anything like that that's that's needed you can always pick up the phone and get in touch with us and we'll be able to give advice that way as well um, if if a foster carer social social worker has received a screening tool from one of our allocated social workers for, for, the, for the child and wants to ask any questions or um, have any advice on how they can um, you know help the foster carer um, safeguard this young person then they can give us a call um, and we can we can talk them through it that's lovely. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, ah, I'm sorry, it's Chris from Health. Can I just add a quick um, part to that question as well? Um, I named, um, I looked after children's team. I named nurses within that team. They do provide ongoing um, training to foster carers um, on a regular basis and exploitation is obviously included in that. And they obviously will, would put on ad, um, ad hoc sessions if required. Wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Yes, sorry, sorry, Kelly, and just to add to that as well, we um, we do offer training to to foster carers as well. We we did a session not so long ago, um, so obviously there'll be another session arranged for that in due course. And we are also as a safeguarding partnership working on, um, you know, the different types of training that we're going to be offering to partners and and people across Warsaw. Lovely, thanks Jade. Um, got a question for um, either Andy or Helen. Um, Christine and Vanessa would like to know, um, do you refer straight to street teams or do they have to go through MASH to make that referral to yourselves? No, We're saying whole... no. On, Sorry Andy, you carry on. <laughs> no, you go on, carry on. Yeah, the, the referral process is changing, but what we say now is put every referral into MASH um, if that doesn't meet a threshold for a safeguarding um, intervention, that, that referral will get to the exploitation team. So it will either come out to ourselves um, or, you know, you've heard from Mike from Warsaw for All as well. So I would put everything needs to go into that central hub, into that missing and exploited children, and then they will advise you from there. Thanks for that, Helen. You might be able to, that kind of follows on to the next question as well, which I know you've been sort of part of that screening tool, Helen. Is somebody's asked um, what research or evidence um, base has been used to redesign the screening tool? Because it is currently um, being redesigned at the moment, isn't it, through the steering group? Yeah. It is, yes. Um, the screening tool has gone through many different stages. And what we have done is taken a lot of learning from other areas um, and the national research on what a screening tool should actually look like. I think it's difficult with screening tools because they're meant to be a tool in the initial instance for a professional or, or the wider partnership to realise that there might, to recognise that there might be some um, concerns. So um, the screening tool is being tested at the moment. I think there's some working groups happening um, to see whether that's you know, fit for all partners. And I think it's going to the safeguarding board later on in, uh, I think it's July or the beginning of August. Um, but the screening tool is mainly a, a combination of, um, it's, a, it's a generic screening tool for all ages, so it's really forward thinking for Warsaw to have done this, you know, we, we're looking at all forms of exploitation and we were trying to make sure that we didn't try and put victims in a box. So um, it was more about, you know, what is this, what's a lived like situation for this person? What do we know contextually about this um, child or adult? What other support networks are in place? So. Um, hopefully you'll get to that soon. I'm not sure if any of our other partners in the line have got anything more to add on that. I just, yeah. just well, I'll just add, I think Helen's really provided a really clear explanation for that. But the screening tool that we've tried to produce, is, as, as, as Helen has alluded to, is linked to sort of good practice nationally, but also, you know, what we know locally in our journey. And it's tried to, it's tried to keep it, as you said, we don't want to box young people, we don't want to box adults up and overly you know um get into their background it's about looking at exploitation from three aspects really you know the victim side location side but also perpetrator side okay so that's the kind of that's the kind of model police work to and that's the kind of model we want to be seen reflected in the screening tool so by by doing that you get a wider contextual approach but you begin to understand the kind of relationships that we know causes uh, exploitation 
Lovely. Thanks for that, Imran and Helen. Um, another question, Helen, that's just come through following on from the um, question around the referrals. If a child already has a social worker, um, then they wouldn't refer necessarily to MASH or would you still require the referral into MASH to access street teams if they already have a social worker? Um, if that child's already identified as um, a child that's been exploited, we would know about that referral anyway from, be, from the partnership or being part of the screening hub or the hub. Um, if you want a referral into street teams and you, the child has already got an allocated social worker, that would be a referral into the missing and exploited, um, I forgot the email address now, um, yeah, missing, and exploited missing children at walker.gov.uk. Yeah. Lovely. Jade, could you just pop that in the comments box so that people have got access to it, please? That'd be really helpful for everybody. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, just somebody really made Ian Billingham um, just, just said that, you know, thank you to all the presentations. We'd love to follow up to see how we could fit in with Safer Warsaw. So obviously that's just for our um, our presenters really about if there's that missing link, how we could make contact with Ian. Um, and I think the last question that's come through is um, somebody would like to know about the situation in relation to exploitation of women, girls and sex working, etc. So where if people wanted additional information, would they find that on the Street Team's website potentially? Um, they can come direct to us if they want some information. I think currently we have um, an offer um, within Sexual Health of Warsaw to offer some outreach, um, not, not by ourselves, but I know Changing Lives we're offering um, on street outreach. I think it is something that we really need to start talking about. I think there is a little bit of a disconnect at the moment between exploitation and adult sex work. And obviously exploitation still happens as our adult partnership um, have mentioned. But I think what we haven't got at the moment is a, um, a, a, a visible presence out, um, especially in terms of the red light district and some of our soreness, not from ourselves anyway. I think I'm, we're quite interested to, to look at you know, some of the adult, sex, well, all of the adult sex workers we're working with, all of those have been groomed before the age of 16, um, sort of like 15, 20 years ago. So it's something as a partnership um, we need to be looking at more. I'm not sure whether adults have any more information on that. Um, I think from an adult's perspective, I'd absolutely agree. And I think that is where within the future world where the exploitation hub will come in because that looks at responding to it. We'll look at responding to exploitation concerns across the age spectrum. But yeah, I think what, what you said is a great initial start. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think you'll hear a lot more about the, there'll be a big launch of, of the hub when that's ready and there's going to be kind of very specific. We might even run another webinar or some training on it as to how people can access it as um, a virtual aspect um, because I think it will change a lot of how we do um, kind of do all that screening on identified children, young people and their families. So there's just one other question which I think Imran has actually answered in the comments, which was about how do we make referrals into Warsaw Right for Children? Mike's no longer with us. He had to do some one on one work with the young person, but I've seen your comment Imran on there to say that the projects are open to all families and those affected by exploitation. Yeah, that, that's right. And um, I think um, Mike Collier's details would be fine as a point of first referral. Okay, okay. so I'll add Mike's in, email address onto the bottom. In terms of families, sorry, Kelly, I'm to jump in. In terms of families, obviously, we've got an offer with um, parents and siblings workers. So you can also access those by going into the Mission Exploited Children um, referral pathway, and we'll be able to pick up. We'll, I think what we're trying to do as a partnership is we're all working together, we're all working as one team, and it, it's looking at who's the right agency for that child or family at that time. So, you know, if we send it into a central hub as well, like we'll, that would help us all work out who, where, who's going where. Is that yeah. And who's best to work, yeah. Absolutely agree, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much. Um, I'd just like to once again thank everybody for attending today's webinar um, and thank you very much for all of our presenters who have taken time out to disseminate very key messages of things that are happening in Warsaw. Um, the next slide, Kerry, just shows you all the information that we've spoken about today. Um, you can find something called links to certain websites on www.warsawlsp.co.uk. <coughs> um, I've added some of the links down the side around sort of um, 
professional curiosity, the um, intelligence form and things like that are ended in the question and answers. They're all on there on that website. We will also following this now I'm going to send you through all of the slides so you've got all of the links and the contact numbers. I'll also be sending you out an evaluation. It takes literally three minutes if that's to complete. It would be really beneficial if you can um, take a few minutes just to complete that just so that we get an idea of things that you'd like to see in the future any future webinars and how you found this webinar and the technology side of it so thank you very much from all of us um, here today and we hope to see you at any future webinars or training that we have thank you thank you bye